Welcome to uh, season three of Power Talk. And my guest today is somebody I've been trying to get on Power Talk for a while, but he's been very busy. And it's good that he's been busy because, you know, he's the type of person who we need to be doing the work, the great work that they're doing. So I'd like to introduce Mr. Martin Griffiths. Could you just explain who you are and what you do? That'd be great. Thank you, yeah. Hi, Ben. Yeah. So uh, my name is Martin Griffiths. I'm a consultant, a trauma and vascular surgeon at the Advanced Health NHS Trust. Um, I'm also, <coughs> in my other jobs, I'm a clinical director for Biostarch in NHS London, and also an NHS um, uh, national clinical director for Biostarch, which is a, a new post. Uh, I'm basically a cutter, uh, a <laughs> London boy, and um, uh, I've got a funny job. Yeah, I mean, we've got, other than obviously you do things around surgery, I'm also a South London boy. I noticed on your Twitter uh, biography that you're a Charlton supporter. Um, and I grew up right next to the Valley, actually. Um, so I went to a few games, but I'm a Chelsea supporter, so, you know, we can go into that another time. Um, yeah. <laughs> but it's really good just to have you on here. I suppose one of the things I want to talk to you about is this role that you've got around, I suppose, violence, um, youth violence, what does that really entail? What is that? I mean, obviously the NHS, you can see from a, a surgery perspective, uh, yeah. you will be the front facing and seeing some stuff. This is kind of like a new role. So do you want to just explain a little bit about that role? And yeah. why, why no, you? No problem at all. Well, why not me, first question? Um, <laughs> Absolutely. I think, I think it, it comes from, so my experience being you know, a Londoner and growing up in and around violence and seeing it in my day job, uh, I saw a lot of young people who had been injured in violence who retaliated or were part of difficult situations. There wasn't much in the way of community or social support with people. So, as a student and as a, as, a, as a junior doctor, I did a lot of work in schools around that work in the community to try and uplift people from the same background I had to try and to, to have higher expectations of themselves and to aspire towards different kind of things rather than what they were perhaps on that narrative. From a clinical perspective, the work I was doing was great and come back to hospital, so I ended up. <clears throat> working with some charities to develop some programs to reduce readmission and, re and re attendance. So, we're working with the community to do some work around to to care with these people to ma match social care with clinical care to make these young people uplift themselves and their families. And that led to work around supporting the NHS in general. So, when the time came for NHS to go stand up and say, How can we address seriously violence in a more cohesive way alongside the Bureau of Administration Unit in London? The role was made for a clinical director in London to actually coordinate the kind of activities that are going on in silos all over the NHS, great pockets in the community, in the GP practices, in hospitals, but to bring them together, combine the expertise, form a really good network, and help support the communities that we are part of. So yes. that's what it's about. It's about us in the NHS working in our communities to reduce ones that we see in our part of. And yeah. I think that's what, that's what this is. And why me? Because it has to be somebody. Somebody you get to see it from A to Z. I see, I see people who are operated that I go to court, I go to prison. Um, I see people on the fringes of violence. I see people in the communities, in the schools. I know the people. I'm part of the people. It's something that I am I'm very passionate about. And I think that if you're that kind of person, you feel obliged to help. As do you. You know, exactly the same. You know, they how you feel. It doesn't matter where you come from. If your if no. your values are linked towards people and support the community, you have to do something about it. This is where it sits. Absolutely. And as you said, like both of us sit on the violence reduction <laughs> reference group, um, uh, which is an interesting space to be. And I think why I love talking to you is because it's a view we don't often hear much about from when we're talking about around violence. Um, we often hear from the police, we often hear from politicians, we hear from youth workers, but the actual people who are surgeons working in the a and &E, the consistency of the type of, I suppose, injuries which are coming through, um, yeah. we often don't hear on a, on a regular basis. And I think it's a shame because it's a voice which I think is necessary. And I'll tell you why. One of the reasons is because I always think we can always talk about the fatalities, which nobody really wants to. But what we don't really talk about is the consistency of injuries. The people who don't die but are seriously injured um, yeah. are equally important to the conversation. But do not make the headlines. So if I suppose from your perspective, what are you seeing? We, we, we know that there's, a, a, there's an increase, but I get the feeling it could be just the tip of the iceberg because obviously 
well, let me not put words in your mouth, but what I could make an assumption is that you're probably seeing a lot more than what is actually being reported. Yeah, so, so I work in major trauma centres, so I see the worst of the worst, and I also see the guys who tip up locally from Tower Hamlet. And we know we only see a proportion of injuries. So, look, the cops themselves at home, get the documentary departments get sent home, the ones who get admitted, the ones who are under, under my care. And we see it, it's a, it's a massive issue, particularly younger people under 25. So now. I think that what we have to recognise is that <clears throat> violence is not it's not new. Okay, it's endemic in our society, in, in British society, all the societies that we are part of. Youth culture today embraces all that's bad about every aspect of the cultures it takes things from. All the bad aspects of American culture, all the bad aspects of Caribbean culture, all the bad aspects of, of English culture, all the bad aspects of Scottish culture, alcohol, drugs, abnormal male belief systems, all these things. In this toxic mix, okay, and you put it, you put it with social media together, you've got, you got this heady mix of negative influences, just really fatalistic attitudes, people who don't compromise, who don't negotiate, who don't listen to themselves or each other, and violence seems to be the obvious thing to do. And it's the least bad thing people do. And my job as a clinician is I, I treat the injuries, okay, that's what I do, I treat people with injuries. I think that's where it's enough, you have to treat injured people. Just look at their families, their backgrounds, understand their stories, and I get the narratives. I understand why things happen. I know it makes no sense to some people why people get that, but I understand things just happen. Sometimes it just happens, and it just has to happen. If you know that, if you understand the situation, you understand the, the relationships, you understand what the patients or people are required to do in certain situations, you know why these things happen. However, you can challenge that narrative. You can make people see there's more to them. And I think it's about self worth, about engagement in society, it's about society reflecting what it actually values are and I think that what we need to do is to understand that, that so many people in our, in, our, in our wonderful city okay do not appreciate their own value they don't feel like they're worthy of engaging in the services that are available to them they, don't, they won't even participate because they're so scared of failure or so scared of being being stigmatized what happens with the views they take of being weak and we don't talk about our feelings, about what's important to us, what we care about, it's about our values. We don't stand for anything, mm-hmm. so we're for for anything. And I, what I'm about is to enter people to recognise their, their beauty and their strength within them, the qualities that they have, to focus on those good things, okay? Promote those good things and see where that takes you, you know? Because I think happy and healthy people have great lives. And we can do much, so much more about it than that. I think that's a, that's a really good point. And I suppose what you're alluding to and what you're talking about is how do we change mindsets? But obviously there is, in my opinion anyways, two ways of doing this. There's the on-the-ground individual kind of one-to-one and then there's a system change. And I think you fall into this kind of middle ground where you are dealing with individuals who have been impacted by this issue, this issue families, but then, obviously, with your role, particularly sitting on the violence reduction unit, there's also this opportunity to develop system and culture change. What would be some of the things that you feel would need to happen? Because we hear and talk a lot about this public health response. We, we hear a, a lot. About, I mean, I just interviewed Lip Peck as well recently, um, director of the violence reduction unit for London. And I think it's great that we're bringing all these different people together. But... I would, it'd be great just to hear from you. What do you really think needs to happen? What is not happening at the moment? What really needs to happen to see a reduction in this youth violence that we're seeing? So the, <clears throat> there are so many things that could happen that would be effective, okay? If you're going to be, if you're going to look at it from a pretty policing point of view, you can put more bullets on the beat and that would drop, drop violence immediately. You can bring in martial law tomorrow, that would reduce violence. That would, make, that would not result in engagement, that would be violence and compliance. I don't want a community to, to engage. A community will heal itself, police itself, enrich itself. So we need to get communities being community. That starts with education. It starts with, and that's the education of everybody. That doesn't just mean teaching children what's right and wrong. It means teaching teachers why children behave in certain ways, why cultures are certain different, and being culturally competent, okay, and culturally, and culturally relatable. We need to teach our, our, our brothers and sisters in the BRU about what society is about and why violence occurs. We need to explain to them in very stark terms what ethnicity and diversity and challenge means. A lot of people who have lives that are blessed, which I want for my own my own family, do not see the lives that I see, and not part of the lives that I see, and need to understand what that's about. When you feel it, you want to change it. 
book about individual work, the reason what gives me hope work I did is I can see the change in individuals that I that I work with and support. I know that people can change despite what the circumstances are, what the backstory is, you can change individuals. But for that to be effective, you have to the community is going to prepare to support that narrative. So then the community needs to understand why it's in that situation. Is it about ethnicity? Is it about poverty? Is it about both? Is it about expectation? Is it about system change? Of course it is. But we need to start off by people actually respecting themselves and seeing their own value. We need to get the narrative straightened out again, prepared to listen to each other and understand it's not about blaming people, it's about taking responsibility for what their culture is about, what society is about. People are proud of who they are, but they don't know who they actually are or where they're from, what that's about. They take a certain aspect of Caribbean culture that relate nothing no relationship to modern day Jamaica, for example. And they take on bits of stuff like that they don't really believe and they don't understand why they're saying what they're saying. And that's not right. We have inquisitive, curious people who know what they're talking about, know what they're talking about, independent voices. And when we've got a community that's, that's curious, that's knowledgeable, that asks difficult questions, that understands the data, speaks for itself, it can help change the system. It should be resistive, receptive, it should be agile. We know that with COVID, we can change things overnight. We're spending trillions of pounds to change things overnight. Because the needs mean the needs it. And we spend trillions of pounds mm. keeping people sitting on their asses, okay? Mm. Mm. We spend a lot less to get people off their asses, okay? Yes. And much of it's changing our society. So it's about recognizing that system change is expensive, it's big, it's agile, and it's game changing. We have to what have to want to happen. And now we need to get that narrative across to everybody in that chain that they want to see that we as a community need support, we as a community need to change, be more caring, be more supportive, be more understanding. Yes. And that the, 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 the violence we see is, is, a, is a marker of failure on a societal level to support youth, to support family orientation, to support people as they develop in challenge, to support what makes people value themselves. Is it about employment? Is it about education? Is it about, is it about physicality? Is it about health? Is it about mental well-being? All these things are important. Yeah, we got a pillar of education, mental well-being, aspiration, delivery, employment, activity, and the way that people can actually fulfil their potential, and, and 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 less less inequalities of all types, okay, and a much more open narrative, things start to change. So I need people to listen to each other and yes. to understand that, that my point of view, my life, is simply my view on my view on the situation. What I know from my life works for me, but it might not work for someone who's seventeen years old. Different same place I did now, though. That's because life has changed, and I need to unlearn my bias, okay? Yes. And take on board what the new world is about. And with that, we can move together. And I'm not saying that I know all the answers, but I'm, but I'm open to change and I want to understand. Yes, and I, and I think you're right. There needs to be multiple. It's not going to be a one size fits all model. There needs to be a multiple uh, different approaches to be dealing with this issue. Now, you, you mentioned, uh, obviously, the, the topical conversation at the moment is, is COVID. Um, I yeah. definitely appreciate, obviously, how busy you guys are. I've got a couple of questions. I suppose the first thing, just in relation to youth violence, yeah. in this period in the last six, seven weeks where, obviously, the, the nation has been uh, changed around COVID-19, have you seen a drop in youth violence uh, and the type of injuries that you're seeing? Um, and... I can imagine, I mean, common sense might say, well, if everybody was in social isolation and lockdown, that should be. But have you seen a drop? Is it coming up? Has it been stable? What's, been, what's kind of been happening in the last seven weeks, very specifically at this time of COVID, around knife crime, youth violence, serious injury? So, um, obviously, I speak, for, I speak from uh, working in major trauma centre and seeing data around this. I can't be absolutely definitive, OK? But what we saw across the communities in London was a significant drop. 60-70% drop in CFU violence in the initial first stages. Remember when London was a ghost town? Everybody was very knocked out. Um, and that sort of like, sort of flattened out, started to build up again. We're, get, we're coming back to more normal levels, but it's still quiet. Right now in London, compared to this time last year, it was absolutely crazy. It was, you know, sun's out, spring, everybody's out and about, everybody's having everybody. It was bonkers. And now it's just quiet. So we're seeing significant amounts of youth violence, we're seeing a significant amount of interpersonal violence. What's interesting is what hasn't changed. What we haven't seen is a drop in deliberate self-harm. We haven't seen a drop in domestic abuse. We haven't seen a drop in domestic violence. And we have seen not increased numbers, but some really 
just mind-boggling injuries for us here, which I've not seen in my practice in the UK. So we're seeing, so what we see is a maintained signal. There's still, there's still violence going on in our community. We're still seeing people being hurt, more so by their partners and by individuals. We know that as lockdown starts to unfold, people will get back on the road and things will start to happen because people are people. But now we're in that, in that place where we've, we've plattered out the bottom down and now going to start building up again. And as, as, as lockdown emerges, we expect to see more violence and possibly a surge around that as well while people address old, address old issues. Well, the window warriors are going to get out and start handling their business to current account of phrase. Yeah, no, that's that's really helpful. And I, I think what you've said there is other surgeons I've spoken to who would have said exactly the same thing. Initial lockdown, quiet, but they are beginning to see some things. And I think what's also interesting is obviously COVID is dominating the media. And where, and where some of these... Where some of these uh, instances would have made the media would have kind of got to... Um, would have got into the headlines, all this type of stuff. Um, I know we've got some people. Yeah. <laughs> they want to. They, they want to jump in the interview as well. Um, I, but yeah, where you've seen, they would have made the headlines. They would have been in the media. They're not even getting in. You know, I'm not seeing these in the newspapers. I'm not seeing some of these uh, serious youth violence incidents. We're we're just seeing like actually nothing actually is coming through. Um, on the television or in the newspapers. And I think that's a shame. I suppose going, continuing with the whole thing around COVID, the question inevitably goes to what is current, the conversation is around the connection between diversity, race and COVID-19. Um, it'd be a great, obviously there's, there's a few perspectives on this. One would, you know, some people would say this is, uh, some people said it, it, it's a black issue or a BAME issue. Some that's one end of the spectrum. Uh, some people would say that it's just basically highlighting what's already been there—the inequalities of, of of racism. And this is a reason why some BAME communities are feeling the impact more. I've heard other ends of the spectrum where it's like actually that's rubbish, and this is just classic victimhood. It'd be great just to hear your perspective and what you feel the, the links are between uh, BAME communities and COVID, um, just from your perspective. So it's a, it's a really tricky one, isn't it? Because I think that everybody's got, uh, uh, some skin in this game, everybody's got an opinion. And the data's kind of confusing because um, people always ask, you know, why are black people violent? The answer is, what the question is actually, why should black people poor or people are violent? And I think if we look at if we look at all the issues around the BAME community, okay, and, and COVID, or if we look at the demographics around the healthcare workers, for example, like that's, that's, they're very much a skewed population. Where's COVID happening? Where's it big? It's in the in the less in the more deprived areas where there are much di- more diversity. It's I think you get sicker ones who have more comorbidities that often sits in groups who have less access to healthcare or less engagement with healthcare. Again, diversity. Um, are there some specific Genetic abnormalities, potentially, okay. But even if you look at the signal, okay, the, the latest data says that, that, that black people are four more like sort of more likely to die of COVID than uh, Caucasian counterparts. When you take out poverty and other kind of social distractors, it's still two to one roughly. I think there's lots about that. There's lots about biological weathering, about the effects of um, institutional racism on people's well-being. Lots of things around about how people engage with healthcare, about how healthcare engages with people. I think it's a very difficult to set out. I think there's a lot about this about about the poverty of action around there. What I think is really important, however, is that it's not, it's not a distracting debate. This is about the inequalities that we see within our society rather than about ethnicity as such. I think it's about trying to level up people. What we've seen magnificently in the past few months is our community, our government, our population supporting the weakest people in there and being active. And what we're doing is identifying where those weak spots are. So rather than just focusing on that in a negative way, we should use that as an opportunity to uplift our societies, to recognise where the support's required, and to invest heavily. We've invested enormously. People are working in big business. We haven't invested in societies who really do need that investment, who really need to be brought back to even parity. Now, I feel if we could actually do that and look at, look at those aspects of the situation much more positively, we can make a lot of difference there. And this is a real opportunity. It sounds ridiculous, doesn't it, in that, in that we're uh, talking about opportunity in, this, in these physical science, but there's a real opportunity to change the game, change the narrative, look at people in a much more uh, positive 
way. So yes, I understand the frustration, the concern, the fears of, of population healthcare workers. But you know, NHS are completely considered to well-being of the entire nation. Particularly, particularly our health workers. We are on the front line. My colleagues are getting sick. Mm-hmm. But we also have to recognise that this change is not going to happen overnight. It isn't something simple like giving a tablet. It isn't like, it isn't like withdrawing people from, from yeah. practice. I am passionate about much. I'm not going to give up working because I'm a higher risk of developing an illness. And I think it's important that we recognise that we just need to be a bit more thoughtful about how we support each other, a bit more thoughtful about what this issue is about, and just to, just to restrain ourselves from that, from that sort of knee-jerk reaction, that, that victimisation, that pit, that thing between the part and part of all the issues around diversity, and, and work together to find out what better really is. Mm, have a, have a proper conversation to change the narrative from being about being people who are, who are entitled and unentitled about working back systems approach looking at how we can look at the inequalities that they have and fix them all not just about about poverty about engagement about support and, and then see how things change and this is a real real opportunity for us to readjust the bank to reframe that debate so yeah I get it I totally get it about people concerned about it but actually it says what, it says more about inequality in our society of every single type had to be addressed. Yeah, I, I think that's a great point. I mean, again, it, it's just highlighting and shining the inequalities which existed pre-COVID. You know, it's not like suddenly COVID is like, oh gosh, now now there's, there's racist, racist structures which are causing problems. No, this stuff was happening before. I suppose you're, you're the first person I've been able to talk to um, who's frontline in the mix of what's going on I suppose it'd be just helpful for our listeners just to get an idea of what it's like. What is it like for you as a, as a frontline worker? What is it like for your, your staff? Or what, what, what are the feelings? Like, you've seen some stuff, but I don't know. I want to hear it from the horse's mouth. Like, what, what is kind of just the feel, the morale like where, where you're working? This is bizarre, actually, because, I mean, we've had to completely change what we do. This is an 800-bedded teaching hospital with bells and whistles, ivory tower, all these big things happening. And then, then literally within weeks, we've converted to a massive intensive care hospital plus break critical care. All our clinicians have moved from their other jobs to moving towards looking up injured people, looking up with sick people, whilst maintaining the integrity of the acute services. And the engagement has been absolutely amazing. Okay. And leadership at every level has been incredible. It's not just leadership from top of the top to top levels, but everybody on every corner, every ward, every clinical area doing their piece and that and being active part of it. What we've seen really is an incredible change in our culture. We've always been about listening to people. Now we can do it actually do it in a real in a real way. People are actually actively volunteering to help. Medical students are volunteering to come to come to come to work before their jobs start to be part of the situation. Happy with the healthcare support workers turning people in and working thumbs at three in the morning because they want to be part of the situation. Okay, and that's what illness is all about. I think that in, there is a lot of anxiety about illness, about getting sick yourself, about whether it's going to be a minor injury or you're going to a ventilator, but that's what we can do. And I think that what we've seen is that what has been magnificent about it is how much people have changed what they do and also the support we've seen <coughs> from the community. You get, I mean, you can't walk here for positive messages from, from people, from obviously food and support whatever it would be. And I think people people are incredibly um, receptive to what we do. And I think that's one thing that's really heartening is we don't really get a lot of thank yous clinical practices. I think that see people highlighting the, the work of the healthcare support workers, the nurses, the porters, the cleaners, the guys who really are proper front lines, one of the guys who are always in, in, the, in the line by like me and my colleagues. But to see people saying thank you to bin men, thank, thank you to the cleaners, thank you to everybody that from there you know, helping us out. That's a real change, actually. I think that, that, that it's never really knew how much you were loved. Mm. Like clapping, you know, <laughs> and I think that, you know, and I think that it's it, the first time I had to, I was really moved by it. I, I'm not going to lie to you, you know, it was a bit smoky in that room when I saw that happen. I didn't, I didn't appreciate where that, where that regarded by our society. We're, I just thought we'd have taken it for granted. Mm. And I think that, you know, I think that, you know, it's, it's humbling to be part of that uh, movement and part of that organisation. I think, you know, to be something active and everybody else is passive is a, is a real, is a real privilege. Yeah. It's not, it's not easy, it's not straightforward and not everybody is enjoying it, you know, but it has to be done. It's been done really well and we're changing literally so much of our practice. 
And this now has to be something we never would have done before. So we're making changes to our organization and structures of thinking, which would have been impossible even a year ago. And that's going to be great for the NHS, but for our community as time goes by. Remote working, working from home, agile movement, agile ways of changing cultures and doing things and snap decisions and, and then changing and changing and changing and being receptive to change, listening to multiple sources of advice and working quickly. That's really good. Yeah. Okay? Mm-hmm. And listening to each other and worrying about our own mental well being, our own mental well, our mental health and communicating that effectively and being careful and being caring to each other. A change. That's, really, that's really helpful just to get that level of insight. I don't want to keep you because I know you're, you're out there saving lives. I suppose if it, I, you know, I, I, don't want to, I don't want to be responsible for somebody not making it because want a conversation with me. But um, what I will say, just very quickly, um, if there's anything you'd want to say to the general public, because what we often get is uh, politicians speaking on your behalf. Um, yeah. I know it's got to be like that, but from someone who's there in the middle of it, what's going on with COVID-19, what would be your message to the general public at this particular point in time? My advice to you is that this is a, a really difficult disease, okay? It's, um, it spreads by dropping in the air, by touch, okay? You spread it, you're asymptomatic, okay? Um, we haven't got a good test for antibody antigen, not yet, okay? And we haven't really got a magic bullet to make it all go away. What we're doing that does work in is staying at home, looking after those that you care about. So if you can stay at home, look after people you care about, be patient with yourself and forgive yourself and other people, we can knock this out. The NHS is doing its best to support our community, but it can't do that if you all get together at the same time. So if you could just please take the time to do nothing, that would be fantastic. Well, listen, I, as I, I said at the start before we recorded, I'm standing with you. I've got my Lewisham Loving NHS uh, T-shirt. And this, this T-shirt was designed by, uh, um, well, Dunn London is the one who designed it and uh, a woman called Alice. And basically all the money from this goes to, to NHS, which is, which is brilliant. But, mate, I want you to just know I'm standing with you. Power to Fight, my organisation stands with you guys. And I suppose on behalf of everyone's watching this, thank you so much for what you're doing. Uh, I know this must be really tricky for, for your family as well, but you're, you're on the front line. But you're on our prayers, you're on our thoughts, and thank you so much for everything you're doing, especially having you sitting on the Violence Reduction Unit. Um, you know, some of the conversations and some of the speeches I've heard in that, in that space have been absolutely inspiring. So thank you and keep doing what you're doing, mate. Um, we're, we're, we're very proud of you and we're walking with you every step of the way. Pleasure and a privilege, my friend. You take care, all right? Take care. God bless. Stay at home. <laughs> 100%. Thank you. Thank all right. You. Take care, mate.